We have now studied what categorical logic can do in terms of immediate inferences on the traditional and modern interpretation of the universal claim. So among other things, we know how to translate an ordinary language sentence into standard form for categorical logic. We know how to construct a Venn diagram that will reveal the logical structure of a categorical proposition. We know how to draw inferences around both the modern and traditional square of opposition. And we know how to make other immediate inferences, namely obversion, conversion, and contraposition, again on both the modern and traditional interpretation of the universal claim. We now move to study categorical syllogisms. What we're doing in this case is, instead of inferring one sentence from another, we will infer one sentence from two others. A syllogism is a two-premise, one-conclusion argument. In other words, a syllogism is a three-proposition argument. What we'll see as we move forward through the sections in this chapter is how we organize an argument to reflect standard form. We'll also learn some of the technical ways in which we can look at an argument that will help us see its structure more clearly. We will learn how to diagram a categorical syllogism on both the modern and traditional interpretations of the universal claim, and we'll look at rules that will govern, in addition to techniques we'll learn using the Venn diagram, rules that will govern how we determine whether or not an argument is valid. Lastly, we'll look at how we can take incomplete arguments, that is, either arguments that are missing a premise or missing a conclusion, and complete it so as to reflect a valid argument. And then we'll also look at how we can reduce the number of terms in an argument that has more than three classes. So, so as to at least attempt to keep these videos, um, each of these videos a manage, um, manageable length, what I'm going to do is focus on sections A and B in this video. And then in the next video, I will focus on sections C through F. And then lastly, in the third video for Chapter 6, I will focus on sections G through I. Okay, let's get started. So uh, you already know what an argument is. You already know uh, when an argument is valid, when an argument is invalid. You also already know in the system of categorical logic that we're dealing with uh, four and four proposition types only. Um, and we understand how to organize a sentence so that it reflects standard form for the categorical proposition. Now, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, we've moved on, or we're moving on, to study the categorical syllogism. We have a syllogism when we have a deductive argument, which is constructed entirely of categorical propositions with exactly two premises and a conclusion. Now, we'll see that there are other types of syllogisms that involve uh, um, statements that are not categorical propositions, um, but we'll get to those in another chapter, chapter 8. So let's take a look at the example that you see on the screen in front of you. It begins with the sentence, all comedians are shy people. So this categorical syllogism consists of two premises, all comedians are shy people, some comedians are good actors, and the conclusion, some good actors are shy people. Now, you might think about the fact that there are three sentences, three categorical propositions in a categorical syllogism, and there are four statement or proposition types in categorical logic. That means that there are 256 permutations of the categorical syllogism. It will be really nice then to have some techniques that we can use in order to organize, handily organize, and test a syllogism for validity. Okay, let's move on to uh, some of the technical terms 
that you'll get used to as you work with them. Um, so don't, I mean, unless you are comfortable with memorizing, I would say don't worry about memorizing them. The more you use the terms as you're working uh, with a syllogism, the uh, more it will be the case that you just come to understand what the terms uh, mean. Okay, so first, the subject of the conclusion is known as the minor term, and that will always be specified with a capital S. The predicate of the conclusion is called the major term. It's always designated or symbolized, uh, designated by or symbolized with a, a capital P. And then the term that is repeated in the premises is called the middle term, and that gets designated or denoted by a capital M. So in the argument before us, all comedians are shy people, some comedians are good actors, so some good actors are shy people. We have good actors as the minor term, shy people as the major term, and comedians as the middle term. So as with other arguments that you've confronted already, you want to identify first your conclusion because that will tell you what your major and your minor terms are. Remember, not every argument is going to arrive already in what's known as standard form for the categorical syllogism. That's what this argument's in right now. So uh, let's take a look at what the requirements are for a categorical syllogism. First, the three statements involved must be in standard form for the categorical proposition. In other words, all three of the statements need to have the quantifier that is in the relevant form, that is uh, a universal all or universal no, and or, sorry, um, the quantifier sum. You also need to have your statement reflect the relevant affirmative or negative. So if you have a universal negative, you use the word no. If you have a particular negative, you use the quantifier sum and the copula are not. In addition, you want to make sure when you're putting your argument in standard form for the categorical syllogism that your major premise is first. Your major premise contains the major term. The major term is the predicate of the conclusion. Second is your minor premise. The minor premise is the, sorry, the minor premise contains the minor term. The minor term is the subject of the conclusion. So when you're looking at an argument that's not yet in standard form, you want to make sure that you identify the conclusion so that you can identify the minor and the major terms and then organize your argument accordingly. Now, this won't be uh, important for you to do when you're dealing with Venn diagrams as a technique for testing an argument for validity, but it sure does help um, as a sort of standard practice to keep yourself organized. You will want uh, to have your argument in standard form when you employ the rules of the syllogism as a technique for testing an argument for validity, since the rules refer to major and minor terms as well as the middle term. Next, we have mood and figure. Each argument can be structured, uh, I'm sorry, I should rephrase that. Each argument can be written in terms of its mood and its figure. The mood of the argument simply consists of the categorical proposition type involved. So when your argument is in standard form, you reflect the mood by way of the order of major premise, minor premise, and conclusions, categorical proposition type, namely the type is A, E, I, or O for each. So in the argument all P, R, M, all S, R, M, all S, R, P, you have three universal affirmatives, 
So the mood of the argument is A, A, A. The mood of the argument in the second example is E, E, O, and that's because the major premise is a universal negative, the minor premise is a universal negative, and the conclusion is a particular negative. If you're just given the mood and figure, you can discern how the argument lays out from those elements alone. So in order to complete this section, let's look at the figure of an argument. The figure has to do with the placement of the middle term in the premises. Notice that in figure one, and your figures will always uh, uh, be one, two, three, or four when they reflect the order of the middle term. In other words, these are the standards for figure figures one, two, three, and four. So figure one always reflects an argument whose middle terms are respectively in the subject position of the major premise and the predicate position of the minor premise. Figure two always reflects an argument whose middle term is in the predicate position of both the major and minor premises. And figure three reflects an argument whose middle term is in the subject position of the major and minor premises. Lastly, figure four reflects an argument whose middle term is always respectively in the predicate and subject positions for the major and the minor premises. Notice too that the letters S and P always reflect the minor and major terms. So the minor term is the subject of the conclusion. Notice that in figure one and two, the minor term is also in the subject position of the minor premise. But in figures three and four, the minor term is in the predicate position of the minor premise. Yeah, it feels like a lot to juggle, but you'll get used to it. Just know that S is the subject of the conclusion and that letter S appears either in the subject position or the predicate position of the minor premise. The same goes for the major term. The major term appears in the major premise. The major premise is first in the order. In figures one and three, the major premise, which is the predicate of the conclusion, appears in the predicate position of the major premise. But in figures two and four, it appears in the subject position. So in terms of the categorical syllogism, the arrangement of subject and predicate positions have nothing to do with the grammatical subject or predicate in the relevant term, uh, sorry, in the relevant premises, namely major and minor premises. So going back to one of our examples, the figure, or sorry, the mood was A, 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 and you can see from the location of the middle term in the major and minor premises respectively that the figure is one. Um, this is a handy chart that will tell you which categorical syllogisms are valid under both interpretations. Remember the, the uh, modern and the traditional interpretation of the universal claim. So you can see, for example, that any argument with mood and figure AAA1 is valid on both interpretations. Okay, so you now understand what a categorical syllogism is, what it means to organize your argument in standard form for the categorical syllogism, and you know what an argument's mood and figure are. Next, we'll move on to techniques for testing an argument for validity on both the modern and traditional interpretation of the universal claim.